So good evening everyone, uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, we're going to be talking this afternoon about some uh, new products coming out from Afro Menelux. And uh, I, my name is Richard Dracott, I run uh, the HPC division for Intel. And I'm just going to give a brief introduction to uh, you know, what we do at a broader level within HPC and then both uh, Afro and Menelux are going to be talking in more specific detail about uh, some of their new offerings. <clears throat> The usual legal disclaimers, which you ought to know by memory by now. So I think most of you will have seen a chart, either very similar to this one or this specific one, which captures the top uh, position of the top 500 over the last you know, 25 plus years, or oh, sorry, 15 years or so of uh, HPC top 500 listings. And whether you look at the number one or the cumulative top 500, or even the bottom of the top 500, there's a very steady exponential growth rate that we've seen that's been uninter uninterrupted now, pretty well for the life of the top 500. And although the most recent numbers on, on here, uh, it, they're still staying on track with this position. And, and the real point here is that within the HPC community, we have seen literally an insatiable demand for new performance. Um, as, the, as the processor vendor here, one of the nice things for me is that no matter what I bring out next, I have customers lining up saying, no, not only is that good, but I need more. And so there's, there's always uh, plenty for me to do. Um, in terms of what's driving that performance, uh, obviously some of it is traditional scientific computing, whether it's physics, chemistry, fluid, fluid dynamics analysis. Some of the examples up here, like weather, weather prediction, climate modeling, um, genomics. All of these are collectively all having the same characteristic. There is always something more you can do. Whether it's getting more granular in terms of how, how far out you can predict the weather or how accurately you can predict the weather or how quickly you can change a prediction. With oil exploration, we're seeing people literally take existing, not only process more and more data as they look more for oil, but take even old data from five, 10 years ago, reprocess it and use it to find things that they weren't able to find with previous processing technology. So um, if we look at both the increasing demand from a performance standpoint and also an increasing array of customers, there are more and more companies realizing that they can take HPC techniques that were previously the domain of the labs and the, and the universities and apply them in a commercial sense, whether it's financial, or things like mechanical modeling, crash testing used to be the domain of cars and airplanes. Now they do crash testing on everything from uh, electric razors and cell phones to even, I believe it or not, uh, diapers. So the, the, the way people are applying this technology in a commercial sense is just growing exponentially. And that's what's driving this ever increasing need. Every time someone new gets into HPC, they realize there's more and more they can do with it. I, I've never seen anybody reduce their requirements. So one of the good things about this is it really takes advantage of Moore's law. And quite frequently, I'm asked, well, you know, how strong and, and persistent is Moore's law? Is it really going to be able to keep providing us with new technology for the foreseeable future? At any given time, we can see out about 10 years. You know, 10 years ago, we were saying, yeah, we think by 2008 we can do this. Uh, but it's been a fairly predictable um, path that we've been on. And this is kind of the roadmap of the different process technologies with which we build the processes. And you can see in November, for example, we introduced the 45 nanometer product line. Uh, some of you may have known that as Harbour Town. If you saw the top 500 presentation this morning, uh, sorry, lunchtime, um, you'll see that Harbour Town is already a substantial, probably around half the list in a relatively short period of time. So it's, not only are we bringing up new technologies on a consistent basis, but we're seeing the HPC community adopt that new technology at an even faster rate with each passing year. We're about a year away from introducing our next process. We've already started building transistors on the process two years out from that, so 2011. And you can see that we have technology and research going out all the way through to about 2017 right now, and hopefully by Next summer, I'll be able to show you another little box for 2019. So at the moment, despite the, the challenges that physics presents, by introducing new te technologies and new materials, we can keep moving forward with Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is all well and good. What do we do with it? We have a design philosophy with an Intel called the TikTok model. 
essentially a tick gives us a new process. This is the stuff that you just saw in the previous foil. Each successive generation of technology is a new process we can use to put more transistors, more cores, faster devices on the product. The 45 nanometer there, Penryn, that is the name of the architecture we introduced in November. So the processor was codenamed Harper Town. You may know it as the Xeon 5400 series. Um, that's already ramping strongly. We are on track to go into production before the end of the year on the Halum, uh, which is the next generation we're bringing along. And we, when I talked about the 32 nanometer coming along in 09, uh, we're already getting that in production ready for Westmere, which is yet another microarchitecture. Um, sorry, it moves the Nahalem architecture onto a new process. And then we're now talking about Sandy Bridge, which is a new microarchitecture on that same process. The bottom line is we have a new cadence or a new technology introduction each year to be able to keep moving forward to meet the demands of Moore's law. Um, just to give one example, on Sandy Bridge, we're already talking about not only additional core counts and new microarchitecture, but also new instructions. And we've announced our ex ex advanced vector extensions, which will enable people to drive even faster floating point performance on Sandy Bridge than they were able to do on Westmere. So the good news is for an HPC user, ever increasing performance on a very predictable basis. In terms of you know, what we expect to do with this, we're, we're looking to really drive research. Um, uh, not just in the pure science sense, but also applied research, whether it's medical, engineering, uh, everything from the R&D angle all the way through to full production. You know, we have people using HPC to manage their production environments because some of them are such high volume that if they don't model them accurately and sufficiently, they end up running into problems and that cuts, you know, ends up being real time to money problems for them. So, as you can see from the top 500 list, we've been, I think we've been very successful in continuing to see a higher and higher percentage of the systems out there based on Intel. Uh, the announcement this today was that we've now hit 75% of the top 500, which is a record for us. And so that's helping us fulfill this vision. But importantly, we are looking beyond just the processor in terms of how we help move the HPC uh, technology and the capabilities forward. Obviously, the processor top right is the core of our business, but other things that we do, we have a lot of R&D in the, you know, the five to 10 year range or even longer, uh, specifically focused on HPC. We've talked about the many core devices over the uh, last couple of years, but we're also doing work on high-speed interconnect, including optical. Uh, we're doing work on software tools to help people take advantage of very high thread count processes that you're gonna be seeing over the next uh, few years. We have software expertise uh, by applications that we use to help our indirect customers, the end users, and the software vendors to adapt their code and, and make it run faster on Intel. And then we get to a few more interesting areas. I'm, I'm not gonna touch everything in here, but I do wanna pick on two in particular. One is the software tools. Um, most people know we have compilers and things like that. Not everybody is aware that we have a fairly rich set of performance tools and libraries. Uh, those tools include things like VTune that help you find the hotspots, threading tools to help you thread your code, which is going to become increasingly important. Um, math libraries for you know, people who really want high performance floating point, and MPI libraries. Now we've had uh, that software portfolio, and I didn't list everything, but we've had that portfolio over the last several years. The next step we've done is to take that and say, what are the major challenges that new or, or smaller companies are having as they start to deploy HPC. And what we found is common even to big companies. And that is for people who don't want to be in the computer science business, who really just want to buy a supercomputer and start doing real computing, whether it's for engineering or for chemistry or whatever, those people find that the biggest challenge to putting a new cluster in place is consistency. The time it takes for them to con consistently and readily bring a cluster in house put it all together, get it up and running. We introduced uh, this conference last year, a program called Intel Cluster Ready. Uh, you're gonna be hearing a bit more about it from APRA because they've actually implemented this uh, within their product line. And the whole idea is how do we make it easier for people to define, purchase, and get a cluster which is not only ready to run, but for which there are applications that have already been tested on that configuration so you can be assured of being able to start computing quickly. So it's all about time to computing.